A reading from Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear, to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. The L- <clears throat> Therefore, I have set my face like flint. And I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Word of God, word of life. A reading from James. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that he, we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, Yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a word of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Word of God, word of life. So, any young people like to come up today? Join me for a children's moment. All right, good morning, guys. Welcome, welcome, have a seat. Have a seat. How are you guys today? Tierra today, is it your birthday? No. All right. Well, I've got a question for you guys. How many of you are feeling green? Blue? Orange, yellow. There's an old saying that if you're feeling green, that's a good thing because at least you know you're growing. Have you ever heard that statement? Things that are green are growing, right? Right? And being green is one way of saying we're inexperienced or we've got a lot to learn. Okay? Like, for instance, there was one time when I was just learning how to fix cars. And I went into a shop that let me bring my car in there for the first time I was going to change my oil and I said to the guy at the shop I'm a little green at this that means I don't know what I'm doing I'm a little green is it okay to be green? huh? is it okay to not know what you're doing? what do you think? yeah it is because then you're going to learn something right? And you guys are at the age where you're very green. 
There's lots of stuff you don't know. So you're going to grow a lot. Like this year in school, right? Being a green person is very, very good. Now today in the scriptures, we're going to hear about that, about how important it is to be green, to be a learner, to be somebody who's got things to learn. Okay? So listen carefully, because even Jesus is one who is learning. Even Jesus is one who is learning. Okay? All right. Blessings to you on your learning this year in Sunday school and in school and everywhere you go. Thanks for coming up. All right, let's rise for the Alleluia. Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Now I said this all quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then he called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wants to become my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, how thankful we are that you are a God who teaches and that you are a God who continually inspires us to listen. We pray that by your grace today, we might have open ears and open minds to all that you might teach us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dearly beloved of God, if you were in worship last weekend, you heard the story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. A curious story because there is a role reversal in that story. As you may recall, Jesus is approached by this woman to heal her daughter, and Jesus refuses at first, but then she persists, and finally Jesus relents. What seems to be happening in that story is that Jesus is learning something about the expansiveness of God's love. Jesus is the pupil, and the woman is the teacher. Now that's a role reversal. And I've been pondering that all week about the fact that Jesus is a learner. Jesus is somebody who's discovering things about God. 
I've been thinking about how it was, how it would be for us if we thought of Jesus that way more. And if we thought of ourselves as disciples, as followers of Jesus, as more learners than people who are expected to have the answers. Well, having all this rattling around in my brain, I encountered the first reading for it today from the prophet Isaiah. It is so-called the third of the servant songs in the book of Isaiah, first two being earlier in the book. And um, a commentary that I read on the passage brought to my attention the fact that the word servant is never used in this song, even though it's called a servant song. Instead, the speaker refers to him or herself as the one who is taught. The one who is taught. Listen again. Morning by morning, the Lord wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. The Lord wakens my ear, opens my ear. It sounds like the speaker is saying, I'm one who is taught. And actually, the Hebrew word there means the same thing as we translate as disciple, one who is taught. And then I open the Gospel of Mark, and lo and behold, what do we encounter there? But Jesus is the teacher. Mark says that after Peter proclaimed Jesus Messiah, Jesus began to teach them many things. Only Mark uses that word here. And so the disciples are learners. In other words, what we have in these scriptures is that Jesus is a, is a learner. The disciples are learners. It suggests to us that maybe that's an identity that we too should adopt. A number of years ago, I was at a conference presented by an author named Martin Copenhaver. Dr. Copenhaver wrote a book. It was entitled, Jesus is the Question. Jesus is the question. And the subtitle of the book, listen to this, is The 307 Questions Jesus Asked and the Three He Answered. <laughs> Dr. Copenhaver did a, a survey of the whole New Testament and found out that Jesus only answered three questions and he asked 307. And he thought about that and he said, doesn't that say something about who we are as people of God? He said, we often think of the church as a place where we get answers. And we think of people like pastors as people who have answers to give us, or at least access to God who will then give us answers about our most pressing questions. And Dr. Copenhaver said, I think that's unhelpful. And it leads to disillusionment because, of course, neither the church nor church leaders have answers to our most pressing questions. Oftentimes, we don't. Indeed, some of the most commonly asked questions are downright unanswerable. For instance, if God is a loving God, why is there so much suffering in the world? Or... If I am freed from sin in Christ, why do I keep sinning? I just try to answer those questions. The fact is that the life of faith is a life of questions, not answers. And if we think somehow being a Christian means that we have answers to life's mysteries, we are woefully mistaken. A life of faith is a life of questions. But the fact is, we can learn many things if we have open ears. And so now let's just look at a few things the disciples were learning in today's gospel. First of all, they learned 
surprisingly, that Jesus had no interest in being proclaimed Messiah. Did you catch that? Jesus had no interest in being proclaimed Messiah. When he said to Peter, who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Messiah. Jesus said, do not say that to anybody. Mark says, he sternly commanded them not to tell a soul. Now, why is that? Probably because Jesus knew that their idea of messiahship was of a Roman general marching into a vanquished city as a victor. And Jesus wanted nothing to do with that model. What the disciples learned next was what Jesus really wanted them to know. That it was necessary that he undergo great suffering and be rejected by the religious leaders and be killed and be raised. Mark says that he said this very openly. In other words, in contrast to his identity as Messiah, Jesus wanted everyone to know that he was suffering servant. Seems to me that these two identities are also important for us to ponder, for we too have need of having open ears to this teaching. When we are, come, when we are called to come and follow Jesus, we are not called to follow a victorious conqueror. No, we are called to follow a suffering servant. We're not called to one who will lead us in a victory parade, but one who lead us to the cross, to Calvary. In other words, following Jesus is not about following the big lottery winner in the sky or whatever model there is out there in the world today. And this gets us to the most important teaching from the passage in Mark's Gospel about what it costs to follow Christ, what it really costs. This has been called the fulcrum of the Gospel. The fulcrum of the Gospel. Jesus said, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will find it. For what will it profit if they gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Or what will you give in return for your life? Here's what Jesus really needs us to have open ears and minds to hear. That it costs us everything to follow Christ. That is so hard to hear. What we might want to hear is that, will you please give me a little something, a little treasure, a little talent, a little time, and I'll be happy with that. We'd like to hear Jesus say that, but it doesn't say that. He says, give me your whole life. That's what he says. He said, if you want to live, you got to die. That's what he says. He says, if you try to secure your existence, it will be futile. You must give your life into God's hands and God will give you a life you never dreamed of. This is the teaching that the disciple Peter could not hear. He could not bear to hear this. When Jesus said, I'm going to the cross, Peter said, this must never happen to you, Lord. And to that, Jesus turned to him and said, get behind me, you tempter, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of human beings. Peter could not hear these words. He could not have open ears to hear these words. He could not conceive of a Christ who would die, and he would not conceive of a Christ who would call him to die. Many years ago, 
There was a famous story about a missionary who went to South America. His name was Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was a man who was passionate about following Christ. And he heard the call to bring the word of the gospel to some of the most remote villages in the Amazon basin. And he went there and he spent years developing relationships with some folks in these remote locations. And these very people, whom he worked so hard to reach, killed him. And after Jim died, his wife, Elizabeth, wrote a book about his life and his ministry, which became a classic. It's called In the Shadow of the Almighty. It tells the story of Jim's life. And in that book, there is one of Jim Elliott's most famous quotes. And it's based on this teaching from Mark's Gospel. He said, No one is a fool to give up that which they cannot keep to gain that which they cannot lose. No one is a fool to give up that which they cannot keep to gain that which they cannot lose. What Jim Elliot understood, what he learned as he pondered the teachings of Jesus, is that our life is not our own. That someday we will die, and the life we have, which began in God, will go back to God. And so it is foolish to try to secure this life with our own hands. It is wise, rather, to let go of our life and let God give us the life God chooses for us. It is wise to let go of the trappings of this world and receive the treasures that God would give us. It is wise to let go of ourselves so that God can fill us with the life God wishes for us. So today, beloved of God, we are called to have open ears and open minds. We are called to be learners, to be those who listen so that we might know more clearly the mind and the way of Christ. I exhort you this day to hear this call. Amen.